Who is Liberia? What does it mean to be Liberia? Why does Liberia exist in the way that it does? And what will be the future of Liberia? Liberia is being bombarded with this history. When he overthrew William V. S. Tutman, I'm a Tutbert, he killed 17 enlisted men. You cannot do that. Let it go to court. If they are found guilty, send them to jail. But he executed them publicly, publicly. And that was one of his downfall. That was his, one of his downfall. Because you are a military person there, we know it. And those guys that he executed, they were not military person there. They were civilian. They don't even go on a firing squad. Send them to jail. That's why we got a court system. The founding of Liberia in the early 1800s was motivated by the domestic politics of slavery and race in the United States, as well as by U.S. foreign policy interests. In 1816, a group of white Americans founded the American Colonization Society, ACS, to deal with the problem of the growing number of free blacks in the United States by resettling them in Africa. The history of the colony and the history of the association are in some ways larger than the association because the American Colonization Society was yet another racist vehicle attempting to trample on the rights of African Americans and Africans by establishing the colony and mapping Liberia as a territory with a particular kind of relationship with the United States, they already began a process of redefining the space, the place, and the people who are in Liberia by this obtrusive act, already devastated by the trade in enslaved Africans. Now this coast was being subject to being divided between the United States, the British, and the other colonial powers in the area. In 1818, the society sent two representatives to West Africa to find a suitable location for the colony, but they were unable to persuade local tribe leaders to sell any territory. In 1820, 88 free black settlers and three society members sailed to Sierra Leone. Before departing, they had signed a constitution requiring that an agent of the society administer the settlement under the U.S. law. They found shelter on Sherbo Island off the west coast of Africa, but many died from malaria. So the U.S. hired individuals to travel to the area and to make uh, lines based on what they thought were the logical borders for this space that they were returning the Africans to. So they had to report to Congress about what they were doing. And in their reports to Congress, they would survey land and they would say, this part is claimed by Liberia. Do you understand? And that there are treaties that might have uh, claimed other territory which rest in the British hands or rest in some other colonial powers hands. And so in this way, the U.S. did all of this very indirectly and created a whole kind of propaganda about they didn't have anything to do with the creation of Liberia. That in fact Liberia was being created by these returning formerly enslaved individuals who were being financed by the American Colonization Society, which was itself financed by these former uh, slave owners, or not former slave owners, current slave owners, who wanted to get rid of all of the free uh, African-American population. Once again, the local leaders resisted American attempts to purchase land. This time, the Navy officer in charge, Lieutenant Robert Stockton, of course, a local ruler 
to sell a strip of land to the society. The Sherbo Island group moved to this new location and other blacks from the United States joined them. The local tribes continually attacked the new colony. And in 1824, the settlers built fortifications for protection. In that same year, the settlement was named Liberia and its capital, Monrovia, in honor of President James Monroe, who had procured more U.S. government money for the project. That population itself right, had already been remade into something which was alien to the Africa that they would arrive in so that the African Americans themselves had been transformed into a kind of African American. They had been transformed from being people to being black people, from being humans to being a group of people who were uh, spoken of badly, treated badly, uh, denied access to the uh, educational institutions in the society, to the economic institutions in society. In, in a word, they had been really marginalized in American society. So if you take this group of people who were trying to rise up in the U.S., their attempts to rise up in the U.S. was to become like the other Americans, which meant they wanted to embrace the kind of Christianity which was racially biased, and they had a negative view of Africa and Africans, like everybody else who was learning about the world through the prism of being in the United States. There was negative information that was always continuously being delivered about the intellectual and civilization capacity of Africa. So many of these early African American arrivals in Liberia carried with them the idea that they were going to civilize the Africans. They were going to teach them civilization. About 5% of the population of Liberia is descended from these settlers. The United States government had provided Liberia some financial support, but Washington expected Monrovia to move towards self-sufficiency. And these were not white people going over to transform Africans. These were African-Americans going over to transform them into their idea of what civilization was about, and especially what embracing Christian civilization was about. So this mapping, right, establishing this border was also part of this identity formation of a marginalized group of people. You had on one hand the Africans who were already assumed by the U.S., right, uh, its government, its military force, to be inferior because they were African. And then you had the African Americans who were trying to understand. And sometimes in their efforts to understand, they portrayed the same ignorance and racism, right, as the white Americans had been teaching them. Some would write and some would engage in intellectual activities to try to get beyond uh, this racism. Blyden, for example. You know, so there are individuals who attempted to go beyond that. But even they were weighed heavily down, right, with the American misconceptions of the role of Islam, of the role of African identity, of the role of different languages, of the engagement and processes of trade, because this is a big trade area, right, with the crew folks and that whole kind of creating a coastal and a, uh, a river, ravine, a ravine kind of uh, a business network that was extremely important for the economy of West Africa and even West Africa's engagement with uh, Europe. So the border making is part of the identity creation, which removed the humanity of the Africans who are there and redefines them in a way which fits the political agenda of the United States and Europe. You're gonna arrive and someone is sitting around and he's like a fifth generation, right? Person who has memorized the Quran. Are you with me? And you're gonna tell them 
they don't understand religion. You're going to tell them that you have a way of belief that they need to become aware of. That they need to change the clothing they wear so that it appears as the clothing that you're wearing. And the clothing you're wearing is a European suit. <laughs> in Liberia. I didn't been to Liberia. It's hot in Liberia, brother. So they want you to change yourself into them as they have tried to change themselves into being a white American. Monrovia. President Monroe. Lib you know, Liberia, liberty. You see the flag? You read the Constitution? America all up in there, right? And that's because of the process of intellectual development and growth of those who partook in this activity of going to this space, which was being mentally colonized by America, if not physically colonized by it. Because the best thing you could do right, is train a slave to be like you and then send that slave back to teach an African what civilization is because their message about what civilization is is going to be being a slave to America or the Europeans or the West. And this is the message they took. And they created a society in that way. And they use their military technology, their support from the U.S. government, their uh, administrative uh, uh, cross-border uh, manipulation. They used all of this stuff to dominate the politics right, of Liberia for over 100 years, for over 150 years. And when all of that collapsed, all of the hostility just boiled up and the people were upset. They were upset by the lack of transparency, by the loss of traditions and customs which gave them access to those in power, and by the elitism expressed by those who claimed to be the descendants right, of the American Liberians, of the uh, descendants of those who return to Africa in this way. But they return transfigured. They returned not, you know, engaging with their ancestors. They returned in conflict with their ancestors. Liberia's president, William Talbert, a descendant of American slaves and a good friend of the U.S., was assassinated today in a coup led by an army enlisted man who said that they're fed up with the government corruption. The new head of the government is the 28-year-old sergeant named Samuel Doe. 1980, Samuel Doe led a brutal coup against the regime of William Tolbert. President Tolbert was killed as well as many of his cabinet members. 1980, April 12th, led Ara Tolbert, one of the best president I've ever had before, was overthrown by Samuel Doe and some of his men from the military barrier. And uh, some of the reasons why they said they were through the Liberian government at the time, they said they were on a pay and there were nepotism that were in the government at the time. They said, which of course it was never really good for some of the, the, the ethnic groups that were in Liberia because most of them were sidelined. Most of the uh, Amer African Americans, and we call the American Liberians that came from overseas, were taking permanent jobs and leaving the native caves. So, that's the time the guys in Rao was a unique event, right? Because it marked that moment where there was going to be an end with the past. No longer were the political forces of the past going to be able to reassert their leadership and control over who would be in leadership and in commerce in Liberia. That's one thing he brought. And now that also gave rise to a, a, a reinvigorated sense of identity transformed now. 
because of this contact with the United States, because of this political domination by a particular class of people who identified with this legacy of the so-called American Liberians, right? So that there is a, a moment in which that politics is undone and a new politics is attempting to be established, but it is crumbling under the weight of a lack of consensus about what the nation is. Who is Liberia? What does it mean to be Liberia? Why does Liberia exist in the way that it does? And what will be the future of Liberia? Liberia is being bombarded with this history. You know, when he overthrew William V. S. Tuckman, I'm a Tuckman, he killed 17 enlisted men. You cannot do that. Let it go to court. If they are found guilty, send them to jail. But he executed them publicly, publicly. And that was one of his dying for. That was his, one of his dying for. Because you are a military person there, we know it. And those guys that he executed, they were not military personnel. They were civilian. They don't even go on a firing squad. Send them to jail. That's why we got a court system. Doe had on his side Thomas Kiwampa during the coup. Kiwampa was from the Geo tribe in Liberia, from Nimba County. In 1983, he was charged for attempting a coup against Doe's regime that forced him to flee the country. In 1985, he came back with some armed men to overthrow those regimes. On the high election, something went all wrong into the assistant, which of course, uh, Samuel Doe started to charge uh, Thomas G. Kwangpa of overthrowing the government. And there, where he fled to another country, the neighboring country, and uh, he stayed there after a certain time, he came back. In 1985, when he came back and there was an overthrowing of the government at the time, for a few hours, and uh, one of the guys, when, when Thomas G. Pompa and someone had met Prince Johnson for sure, which of course he was part of, Prince Johnson be part of the Iron Bandit for a very long time. And when the overthrew, one of the guys that called McQueen, who came with Thomas G. Pompa at the time, was left with Samuel Du at the time Samuel Du was apprehended. The whole Labrin the government was already shut down. Government was in chaos. But it was peaceful when you look at it logically. Because there was no lot of bloodshed among civilians. The casualty were only among military personnel. So when they had Samuel Du start up, Kongwaka and somebody had met one to the radio station that wanted to maybe to other government entities to, to run up some people. And uh, all of a sudden they say Samuel Du took over. Because the guy who was uh, who was in charge of taking care of Samedo at the time? Somebody said Samedo bribed with a huge amount of money, and which of course he let Samedo to go, and Samedo executed the guy that called General McQui. For sure, he was named as McQui, and Samedo took over the country when he took and he told him military man, uh, the the, uh, the coup was a failed coup at the time, and wherever uh, Kwangba was, he was arrested, and that's the time Prince Joseph started to escape. Prince Joseph managed by all because they were all military personnel to know the Bujas in Liberia and he got along from one point to another. He crossed to Ivory Coast from Ivory Coast. I mean getting uh Nima from Nima to Ivory Coast. He went to wherever he went. And unfortunately for Thomas G. Kwampa, he was apprehended and he was brutally killed. Brutal was kind of really brutal. If you see the images they had on television carried it uh, in newspaper, it was very brutal. Because of that attempt, the government march to Nimba County and killed 3,000 people. Since then, a tension started between the indigenous tribes in Liberia. Samuel Du went in Nimba County, he killed a lot of Nimbalans, and even he went in Monrovia to the St. Peter Lutheran Church, located on the 14th Street, because most of the people from Monrovia, the West, a big church, want to seek refuge. Samuel Du and his men went in there. There was a huge massacre, and up to this time, there's a there, there's a grave site that is set as in the self as a monument of those who lost their life at the time that Samuel do uh, executed. Samuel Kiddo, that's why he was a president, but he had some blood on his hand because of the casualty he uh, he had on like brave people. Even when he overthrew William V. S. Tuckman, Emma Tuckman, he killed 17 enlisted men. Charles Taylor studied 
in the United States and returned to Liberia. He worked in the government of Doe, but was accused of embezzlement of $1 million. He fled to the U.S. and was arrested. He managed to leave the U.S. after a prison break. He then went to Libya and trained in guerrilla fight. In 1989, he returned to Liberia with his National Patriotic Front of Liberia, NFPL, to fight the regime of Samuel Doe. That was the beginning of the brutal Liberian Civil War. Prince Johnson, who was eager to revenge, joined force with Taylor, but the alliance did not last long. From Niba County, December 1989, that's the time the, uh, the uprising started in, in Liberia at the time, and people did not really know about rebel movement because most of the people were not educated to some of the catastrophes that they were, going, they were going to go through. They just felt because of rebel movement when they come in, they just go to arrest the president or do this, you know what I mean? Few people were going to be wounded and everything was going to be over. But Liberian people were miscalculating at the time. Charles Taylor had a unit composed with a lot of young kids aged 7 and up. They were brainwashed and drugged for battles and to control checkpoints. That strategy happens to be very effective because Taylor was able to control most part of the country. As they moved toward Monrovia, two tribes were the main target, the Maningo and the Krong, which gave rise to a new rebel force, ULIMO, composed of those two tribes. When, uh, when Chastino went in there, when he deflected from uh, their goals or their aim of overthrowing the government, he declared himself president and he high school political capital in Banga. He took what radio station, he executed most of the government employees that were there at the time. It does not mean because they got them with government employees and when Charles Sula went there, most of the rebels said, oh, you guys were enjoying. And he brutally murdered some of those guys. And Prince Johnson, especially Prince Johnson, Prince Johnson got ignored. But when Charles Sula went there from 1989 to them like 1993, 94, there were only two movements, which of course were oh, Prince Johnson, NPFLJ, Johnson, we for Johnson and NPFL for Charleston, the other NPFL for Charleston, original NPFL at the time, because they split over certain agreement that Charleston was not wanted to abide by when they went and took over the whole Marovia, which of course the Madingos, the Madingos got annoyed because Charleston was exec executing more than most of the boys from Nima County. I don't know for what reason they had with the Madingos. They started to execute most of the guys, and they were Muslims. They executed some of those guys. And there was no place for them in, in, in Morovia, in Liberia, so they had to maybe go to another country, like neighboring country, like Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Africa to survive. And which, of course, yeah, they had to go, they had, they had to go to another country for them, for them to make life. And uh, he went in Lufa County to committing careers in Lufa County. Prince Johnson captured Samuel Doe with the help of Ikoma. They tortured Doe to death. Prince Johnson was in Morovia. He, he had a base in Conway, Morovia, just outside Monrovia, like less than 10 minute drive from Monrovia, from the, the capital city of Monrovia to this particular city they called Conway, where Prince Johnson was based. And there was some kind of negotiation on the ground around uh, the free port of Monrovia. And they invited Samuel Du for a peace talk so they can see how best he can, you know, solve some of the problems in Liberia. So Prince Samuel Du and some of his men left from the executive mansion, they went to the uh, free port of Monrovia. When they went to the free port of Monrovia, they went, not only it was a trap that Prince Johnson was trying to set up for, for, for Samuel Du, when they went there, there was a heavy gunfire around there. On the, unfortunately, Prince, uh, Samuel, Prince Johnson captured Samuel Du, and he was brutally murdered. Nobody didn't want to see, it was very, very gruesome. In 1997, after a ceasefire, an election took place and Charles Taylor was elected as the 22nd president of Liberia. Once in office, he removed about 25,000 Crown people from the army. We had Charles Taylor, Charles Taylor, Charles Taylor kid when he elected Charles Taylor, most of the poor afraid. They said if we don't elect Charles Taylor to be our president, when he leaves, he's still gonna come back. 
Taylor armed the rebels from his neighboring countries of Sierra Leone and Guinea in exchange of diamonds. Fortunately, Charles Titter was apprehended because he masterminded the activities of, from uh, Footy Sanko from Sierra Leone. He get a pass from Footy Sanko because it was in his territory. He was holding that territory in Lofa County and he get a passage to Footy Sanko for Footy Sanko to carry a rebel movement into Sierra Leone. That's so much chance to the down for it. He left Footy Sanko to go to Sierra Leone and Footy Sanko, when he killed most of the guys, I think maybe you watched some of the movie before, maybe your, some of your colleagues have watched the movie before they called Blood Diamond. Cutting in somebody's arms up because the person is from Sierra Leone. That's insane for this Sanko. And I condemn Charles Tudor for that. Cutting their hands. And Charles Tudor refused to accept the fact that he left shot of uh, for this Sanko to go to Liberia. But it went through investigation that the president for, for Sierra Leone at the time, uh, Kruman. Kruman fired a case to the head and all of a sudden Charles Tudor was found guilty because he was in Liberia at the time. They told him to leave. Charles Tudor was supposed to leave. When the Guinean army pushed out the rebels, the president allowed recruitment to take place and he helped finance it. From there, the Maningo tribe formed a different rebel group called LURD, Lord, on its head, Sekou Kone. The Bush administration is pressing the Liberian leader to leave the country. He's seen by many as the biggest impediment to peace in the region. Librarian people is getting worse and worse and worse. And so our uh, commitment is to enable ECOWAS to go in. And the Pentagon will make it clear over time what that means. Uh, secondly, it is very important for Charles Taylor to leave the country. What if I had just hired Taylor out of town three weeks ago? Catastrophe in Liberia. Finally, I said, I'm not going in a place until troops come. Everybody said, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. We need to send some troops in there. Why didn't someone know that before? Why would they let President Bush, his advisors, let President Bush get on the air and make such a provocative statement without giving him all of the facts? They've shelled the city. If they had broken through our lines, what would have happened? They would have murdered thousands. I actually heard that the, the, the shell that hit the embassy, they were able to track it back to... American, American mortars given to Guinea under the pretext of, being, of using it for training purposes. Thousands of them have entered here. Uh, there's very little that anybody can say about this. I said, this is a United States covert war and they've got Liberian blood on their hands. The Lord took over Monrovia and forced Charles Taylor to exile in Nigeria. Hey. And Charles Taylor, the only country that accepted Charles Taylor at the time was Nigeria. Nigeria gave him a passage and a political asylum. When he went to Nigeria, living in one of those states, maybe he felt his security was not that guarantee. So he was trying to leave from uh, from uh, from Nigeria to another country, and there's the time the upper hand Charles Taylor, and it was it was the same to Moravia. He went Moravia from Moravia. He went to the head. A few years ago, when uh, Ellen Johnson ran to be president on the United Party ticket, and uh, she was successful, and now she became the first female president of Liberia. How a graduate? Hey, I applaud her for that. She did extremely well. She pulled Liberia on the pace and. She ruled for the first term six years and now she went for the second term. The first time was kind of really okay. Everything was calm in Monrovia, uh, in Liberia. There's meaningful development going on. She set up, you know, stuff that the Liberian people were already expecting at the time from, from Charles Taylor, but Charles Taylor did not listen to the West. But Ellen Johnson came, she had a good relationship and she's very educated, as I said, and I give an applause for that. And she would want to meet war leaders from one point to another, and she even won a Nobel Peace Award. March 2013, 11 years since the end of the conflict, rose another war. This time, the enemy was a virus, the Ebola virus. Oh, yeah, it's like the problem we have with the whole Ebola situation. The whole Ebola stuff, it's a virus. It was a testing lab that was in uh, Guinea and Liberia. But Liberian people doesn't want to admit to it. It's written. We can see it. It's a testing lab from over here, from overseas, from in the U.S. 
In Australia, it was a testing lab. They had animals in there, and some of the animals got away, and it went into societies. And most of the African, they, they, they feed on the, uh, bush animals. So they have most of the animals leave from one point to another, and they went getting in, but into to, to different environment. When they went to a different environment, they infested the other animals. And it's, it, the virus that there, it will also affect a human being. He owns a patent on a particular strain of Ebola known as Ebobun. The question here is why would a government organization claim to have invented an infectious disease and then claim a monopoly over its commercial use? And the possible answer would be to cause panic, introduce a vaccine, and push countries into buying billions of dollars worth of vaccines. A patent that the U.S. government gave for Ebola in 2012. It says it's invented and it was made in its abstract for experimentation. Uh, governments in Africa were given about $140 million to let experimentation start in January of this year. And now we see people dying from it because it was a disease made to kill and it's killing. And in reality, uh, this late move to me has more to do with creating a panic so people can sell medication as well as kill Africans. Uh, this gentleman and I are going to disagree. I'm an African-American and quite proud of it. Uh, Anglo-Americans have been killing African people for profit and for land for 500 years. This is just another instance. And this is as clear as this government patent. And I dare him to tell me this is a conspiracy theory when they say they made it. When they, this has the U.S. Department of Health as an assignee to this patent for someone to say to me that uh, it's a conspiracy theory when they say so. 2017, a new election took place. Ex-football player George Ware is expected to face Liberian Vice President Joseph Boakai in a runoff for the country's presidency. George Ware, the famous ex-soccer player, took as running mate the wife of Charles Taylor. President in Liberia right now, but uh, the country like broke in on independent 1847. But since that time, Liberia has not improved compared to the other countries that gained independence in the 70s, the 60s, and uh, present time. But uh, we're still looking forward to meaningful development of the quite recent, the high of uh, the election into our country, and, uh, which of course Joseph Boakai, George Weir, and other guys had a lot of political parties in the, in the league. But President, we are looking at the runoff between George Weir from the CDC and uh, Joseph Boakai from the United Party. And now, uh, the one neck to neck, but uh, some of the political parties did not ready to go far into the election. So now they're looking for the runoff between Joseph Boakai and George Weir. And uh, the election commission in Liberia have postponed the election date because one of the party, Stella Berry, called Bronsky, Charles Bronsky, fought a complaint that. The election was not fair, and uh, the Temple of Justice or the Justice Department had to look into that case. And uh, they got to take it serious because it is his concern. And now the matter was throwing up the Justice Ministry, they told him to go to the National Election Commission of Liberia. And now it's still on the table, but up to this time, we, don't, we, are, we do not already know the set date of the election. And looking at George Weir in the lead and Joseph Walker, Joseph Walker from the Utah Party. He got a lot of experience and he's old. Oh, I do agree it will need change in the environment, but if you're looking for change, change that will come into the positive direction, we're not looking for change that will come and be a catastrophe in the end. People are saying they like George Weir. I personally love George Weir and I love Joseph Boakai, but George Weir is just going into the political cycle right now. He does not have that international experience in politics. And playing soccer and being a war best is quite different when you're taking political office, as we can see in other parts of the world, even part of the U.S., we can see it today. George Weir is not 100% easy to lead the Liberian people. You can lead an organization, or maybe 15, 20 person, but for you to lead a nation with 2.5 billion or even 3 billion people, it's kind of really hard. And now I know he got a lot of supporters, and uh, both parties, they got a lot of supporters. But we are really eager on seeing something that will come fruitful for our brand people. And now uh, we're looking at the President Ellen Johnson Sally because she's cross copied from a uh, United Party. And I learned that she's supporting CDC, but I have not seen the any kind of written document, so that I cannot prove it. 
It's just a rumor that's circulating. And in African societies, the rumor is circulating 75% of the rumor. Sometimes there's a great possibility it might be true. So, but we look here, we're kind of wearing between it and looking at you know, to see, to do our check and balances. But if I thought she did, then it's not fair to the party. Because what, no matter how and no matter what it is, if you're from a youth party or you're from any kind of political party, you're supposed to support the candidate that will be running to be your next successor. But she did not do it. But most of her kids and Ellen Johnson have crossed over to the youth party and they're supporting George Weir. And the problem the international community guy with George Weir, I think that some of the process that is why delaying the library election coming pre uh, soon because. The international community and the West African region, they do not really have enough trust in George Weir because of the fight. And know for sure that I saw it on video. She linking up, he linking up with Charles Titter. He be getting the boxes from Charles Titter, which of course is on video, and I can prove that. And his wife, uh, Charles Titter's wife, Joy Howard Titter, who's sitting as a running mate to Charles Titter, she said she's going to go ahead with Charles, some of Charles Titter's plan. The international community, especially the West Africa, most of the West African countries send troops in Liberia to keep peace, to bring that stability. Most of the guys did die. The first thing Liberia needs to do is not forget about any conflict. Liberia needs a critical analysis of its history, an assessment of why these conflicts are there, a rene renegotiated contract between the government and the people of Liberia. A conversation about a, re a renaissance of Liberia. Liberian culture reimagined. Liberian people reimagined. Reimagined for the future. A future which consists of evaluating the past that it has had, but is assertive about using this moment to make a better Liberia in the days to come. Liberia doesn't have a choice. 